With Final Fantasy VII Remake's delay, it has given Square Enix an opportunity to roll out more information about the game, and we've actually learned a lot about the game recently, and that's what I want to bring to you guys, especially with how excited I know a lot of you guys are for this game. Keeping up to date with all of the ongoings with the title I think is very important, especially with FF7 Remake definitely altering a lot from Final Fantasy VII. That might not be getting as much play as the idea of this remake happening. A lot of people seem to think it's just going to be a one-to-one -one carbon copy of Final Fantasy VII, and that's not necessarily the case. The fundamental storyline is going to be intact by the looks of it, but they are adding a lot of content to the game, and that goes into play with the game being a multiple parts, episodic, whatever you want to call it. But without further ado, do, I want to highlight six huge new things we've learned about Final Fantasy VII Remake recently. It's all coming from a new uh, news rollout that Square Enix did, so let's get right into it. Starting with number one, I want to go over with all of the new characters that have been detailed. If you are familiar with FF7, these characters are going to ring home. However, for the newcomer, there are a lot of things to go over. So first of all, one of my favorite characters in Final Fantasy VII, that is Red Thirteen. Little interesting of a fella here. He has a red fur, sharp claws, and a flaming tail, but Red 13 is no mindless beast. In fact, he's as intelligent and well-spoken as any human. You really got a sense of that in the trailer where when he speaks, the rest of the cast is a little bit bugged out, but you can immediately tell that this is an intelligent being. In Final Fantasy VII Remake, he's in, well, let's just call it a tough spot. He has been captured and used as a test subject by Shinra scientist Hojo. Expect Red 13 to be one of the fundamental characters of Final Fantasy VII. Next up, as the aforementioned character, Professor Hojo, the director of Shinra's research and development division, is not a man bound by common ethics or mor uh, morality in being a professor and his experiments. If his experiments require him to take a life, he's going to do that without hesitation. His scientific acumen is undeniably impressive. In a previous collaborative role, he performed special surgery on soldiers to increase their physical strength. In doing so, he actually helped birth Shinra's elite soldier unit. Definitely not the most ethical professor that or doctor you're gonna come around however his experiments definitely do come across effective but one of the more antagonistic characters that you're going to come across within the Final Fantasy VII storyline. Next up, we have Chadley, a 15-year-old research trainee who works under Professor Hojo. You're going to find him in the Sector 7 slums where he researches new types of materia. If Cloud helps out, he'll develop and sell materia for the team. Battle report quests are available from Chadley. He will request that you complete various requirements, such as using assess materia a certain number of times or defeating enemies in a specific way. Complete these tasks and he'll develop more materia that you can purchase. He's just really around to help Cloud facilitate what he wants to do in terms of these battle reports and get more materia. And again, he's going to help and develop and sell these materia for the team. Moving on to number two, one of the imperative talking points about Final Fantasy VII Remake has been the combat, and we got more combat details regarding a specific very iconic character, and that is Tifa Lockhart. Tifa Lockhart, she is a brave member of the anti-Shinra group Avalanche, a loyal friend and the owner of the best bar in the Sector 7 slums, just ask Wedge. She is also a powerful warrior who takes down opponents with fast strikes with just her fists and feet in battle. Tifa is a swift fighter. Repeated presses of the square button will let her perform quick combos. Of course, being more of a boxer, she implements a different battle style and presentation style even in terms of her combat than every other character in Final Fantasy VII. She also has a powerful, unique ability. Press the triangle button after a combo and she will release some powerful moves. We've got Whirling Uppercut, a powerful upward strike that will send a foe soaring. Omni Strike, Tifa slams in, into the enemy with a brutal shoulder barge. Rise and Fall, after waves of kicks, Tifa finishes with a powerful blow from her fist. Those aren't the only details we got on Tifa's battle skills. We've also got details on Tifa's battle abilities. In Final Fantasy VII Remake, attacking enemies will fill your ATB bar. When it's full, you can use it to launch a special ability. We previously saw, seen some of Eret's moves, but what does Tifa bring to the party? You've got True Strike, hits an enemy directly in front of her, and then you also have Dive Kick, a high-power mid-air kick. Of course, Tifa's gonna be one of the mainstays in the 
combat and in the game in general. So hearing about her combat details is definitely something I wanted to bring to you guys as, again, she's one of the most iconic characters in all of the Final Fantasy VII lore and story. Number three, we have more details on materia and weapons. We got details on the healing materia. Healing materia lets you use healing spells like Cure and Cura in the shot above. Eretz using Regen, a spell that gradually heals a target for a set period of time. Of Obviously, Aerith is known to be the healer of the squad, so she's going to be using a lot of the healing materia, but it will be implemented into a lot of other characters as well. We also have details on Deadly Dodge materia. Deadly Dodge materia lets you turn any attack after evading into a powerful melee strike. We can see Cloud using it in the images that they posted, although any character can equip it too. And lastly, we have a new weapon, Nail Bat. Nail Bat, one of the most fondly remembered weapons from the original game, is reimagined in glorious styles. They showed off a screenshot. When you equip a new weapon, your character's appearance will change in and out of battle. So good to see that they've put attention to detail in this regard, where if you do change equipment, they also change with in-game. So of that attention to detail, I do think goes a long way. And while that wasn't evident in a lot of the older JRPGs, that is something that should be more readily seen in a JRPG or any game really in 2020 where you are swapping weapons and whatever the case may be on that. Number four, mercenary quests have been given some insight. Citizens and merchants across Midgar will ask Cloud for help. As a jack of all trades, Cloud will help them with these quests, which could be anything from taking down some troublesome monsters to helping find a lost cat. So obviously, this content being introduced is the content that is going to be some of the items that are going to flesh out the game a little bit more than the original Final Fantasy VII. Yes, with the game being episodic, you're not getting the entirety of the story of Final Fantasy VII right out of the gate, but they're also fleshing out each section of the game, so that doesn't necessarily mean that playtime of, let's say, if it's a part one of three, it's not going to be only a third of the playtime of Final Fantasy VII. I don't really have insight as to how lengthy and content-filled the game will be, but they're definitely adding content to give you value for your dollar, so bear that in mind when you hear all of the episodic game talk. I do believe Square Enix should make it abundantly known, put it on the cover, put it on the back of the case, whatever the case may be, to let people know that this is going to be an episodic experience because Final Fantasy VII is a game so many people are nostalgic with. Nonetheless, this is a topic I've covered so many times. It's nice to see that they are fleshing out the game with additional content. We also have an insight on the Sector 7 Slums quest. This quest tasks Cloud with taking care of some drakes. If he completes it, he'll be well rewarded. So that's a pretty basic quest. However, the content like that I feel like is something that JRPG fans, Final Fantasy fans really do delve into, and if it adds some context into the world as well, which we're expecting to see content like that as well, where we do get some characters fleshed out, some of the side characters, whatever the case may be, that is going to add a layer to the game that I do think is necessary, especially for a JRPG in 2020. Number five, what's one of the biggest elements in any Final Fantasy game? That is the summonings, and we've got new details on a bunch of the summonings. Summons are a powerful type of materia, equip one to a character, and they'll be able to bring a powerful ally into battle. First of all, we have Chocobo Chick. We know what you're probably thinking with this one. Aw, isn't it adorable? How could something so cute and fluffy be dangerous? Don't be fooled, however. Chocobo Chick is plenty powerful and will assault your foes with powerful attacks. It's included when you pre-order any edition of Final Fantasy VII Remake, so they are incentivizing you to pre-order the game. Next up, we have Carbuncle. Carbuncle is a mystical creature with a ruby attached to its forehead. It gives power to allies with the Shining Gem. This summon is included with pre-orders of the Digital Deluxe Edition from the PlayStation Store. And lastly, we have Cactuar. Cactuar is a true icon of the Final Fantasy series and Final Fantasy VII Remake. This summon uses incredibly powerful needle attacks while always keeping that trademark vacant expression. You will get Cactuar when we uh, when you pre-order the Deluxe Edition, Digital Deluxe Edition, or First Class Editions of the game. So they're really incentivizing you to pre-order the various editions of the games with all of these summonings. A little bit of a bummer in that regard. But nonetheless, cool to see all of these summonings make their presence felt in the Final Fantasy 7 remake and personally speaking Carbuncle is a very iconic character and I'm excited to see Cactuar he's one of the more iconic characters in Final Fantasy 7 so he's going to be a nice little addition to the game as well if you do pre-order the various editions of the game and lastly number six we've got details on some of the environments of the game again talking about fleshing out Final Fantasy 7 as a whole that's what they're doing with the FF7 remake Final Fantasy 7 remake reimagines iconic Midgar locations but also expands them to feature brand new areas that weren't in the original game. 
First of all, we have the Mako Reactor. This Mako Reactor sucks out Mako from the core of the planet. The Shinra Electrical Power Company turns it into electricity or liquid gas for cities to produce materia and for other scientific research. Shinra has a total monopoly on the resource and has built several reactors around the world. That said, the safety of these structures has been questioned as there have been a confirmed accidents in remote locations. And lastly, we also have the Corkscrew Tunnel. The Corkscrew Tunnel connects the streets of the slums beneath Midgar's plate to the living area areas on the top. The tunnel coils upward and a giant corkscrew through the center of Midgard and anyone who rides the train is, are, is ID checked. If an unauthorized intruder is discovered, they are dealt with harshly and very quickly. These are only two locations that have been detailed with the Final Fantasy VII Remake, but do expect a lot of other locations to be fleshed out much more than we saw in the original Final Fantasy VII, given the original FF7 came out all the way back in 97. That is kind of to be expected. And that's going to conclude this video. Again, a lot of Final Fantasy VII Remake information is rolling out. Given the fact that the game was originally scheduled to be released in just about two weeks, a little bit of a bummer now that we are waiting all the way until April 10th. However, that's still not a long ways away. And given the fact that Final Fantasy VII Remake was originally teased all the way back at like E3 of 2005 and 2006, that's when people really started to want it after that FF7 tech demo. Is another month really going to kill us? I don't think so. And I am getting even more excited for the release of FF7 Remake, and I'm hoping it turns out really well. That's going to conclude this video. Sound off with all of your thoughts in the comment section down below. Definitely want to hear what you guys think and what your anticipation level for the FF7 Remake is. Thank you for watching, and goodbye. Hey guys, we hope you enjoyed the video, and if you did, make sure to hit the subscribe button, and if you're already subscribed, do us a favor and hit the bell icon. This way you'll be notified whenever we post a new video. That's the best way to keep up with all of our uploads, and we usually try to upload two videos a day. And with the bell icon hit, you'll be notified whenever we do upload a video. As always, thanks for watching.